is to plot or not, and it's just talking about the idea of do you plot in advance, do you write by the proverbial seat of your pants. Um, before we get started talking about that, though, since some of you are new, I'll go ahead and have everybody introduce themselves. Do you want to start? Sure. Hi, I'm Steve Sullivan, and I'm one of the old TSR guys. I started in, uh, at TSR in 1980. And I haven't been to Gen Con Indy yet, though. I used to go every year at uh, Milwaukee. So I knew you may remember I did this strip in uh, the Dragon Magazine. Uh, I've done more maps than God, perhaps. And uh, <laughs> written 30 novels, and pub written and published over 30 novels. So, Hi, I'm Brad Bullier. I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I just got my first debut novel that came out this year. It's an epic fantasy from Nightshade Books called The Winds of Pelicobo. Uh, but I've been in this thing for about 10 years or so, writing uh, some novels as I went along, of course, but um, uh, short fiction largely as well. Uh, my name is Mark Casson. I've written a, a lot of short fiction as well. I've written for games. Um, I've done some work doing co-authoring on novels and writing plot synopses for novels. Um, and doing a fair amount of that and doing some editing. I'm Lawrence C. Connolly. My stories have been in <clears throat> Twilight Zone magazine, Fantasy and Science Fiction, Cemetery Dance, Year's Best Horror, and they've all been collected in a new book from Ash Tree Press called This Way of Egress. I also have a series of novels called The Vein Cycle. And uh, the publisher, Fantasist Enterprises, has a uh, table down in Author's Alley. I'm going to be hanging out there after uh, this panel. If any of you want to come down there and just talk and hang out and keep me company, it gets, sometimes it gets kind of lonely down there. <laughs> um, so, um, but uh, if, if, we, if we talk about anything that you'd like to follow up on, uh, let me know because uh, there's a lot to talk about uh, with plot. Mm -hmm. All right, so I guess... I'm going to start out with just the simplest of questions. When you guys sit down to work on a novel, how much plot work do you do in advance, and how much do you just start writing? I'm one of these really meticulous plotting people. I write outlines, and then I write more outlines, and then I do story bibles, and I have... Uh, I'm working on a series of horror novels now where the story bible is 18,000 words long at this point and growing. Mm. Now that's going to be a series. The novels are, themselves are not going to be that long, but I believe in having the ducks in a row, being able to look at where my roadmap is and go there. Um, I'm I'm very plot oriented, I guess, in some ways. Now, on the other hand, when I write short stories, I've discovered that if I do that, I end up with novellas. <laughs> <laughs> So with short stories, I generally try to just find an idea and follow it and see where it goes. I, I would have sworn that I would be exactly like Steve is. Um, I'm a software programmer. I come from you know, a very structured background in terms of my work. Uh, but on the creative side, I, I found that I, I just couldn't do it completely. So I'm actually a tweener. Um, there, you know, you'll, you'll find people that, that don't plot very much, some people that do. I'm kind of right in the middle. So um, what I tend to do, uh, there, there's a reading like the Randy Ingersoll, I think, um, the snowflake method. If you haven't heard about this, look it up, uh, snowflake method. So the, the notion is that you start with a single sentence. This would be like your hook for your, for your novel. Um, really try to make that shine. Uh, try to encapsulate, you know, your whole thing in, in one sentence. And then you take that, expand it into one paragraph, you know, three, four, five sentences. Uh, then you take those, each, page, each line in that, in that paragraph becomes its own paragraph. And now suddenly you have five paragraphs, one page on your, on your novel. Um, and it continues. You, you, the snowflake is, is expanding, right? Um, so I get that about as far as I can. Um, and what I find, though, is that uh, I want to have a clear idea of the end. I want to have a clear idea of uh, the two or so turning points, the big high points in the book. Uh, so now I have kind of three points. And then I, I plot out uh, fairly detailed uh, the first third or so of the book. And then as I move forward towards that third, things will start to become more and more fuzzy, less and less clear to me. And so I'll just stop at some point, uh, and I'll, I'll fill in more of the gaps and then start again, start moving forward. So, so that's what I do. I, I kind of do an iterative process. I get as far as I can in plotting, and then I start, and then I just I fill in details as I go until it's all done. And then by the time I'm finished, uh, there's inevitably some things that I, I just could not see in the, f the first time because characters come into play, ideas you never thought of before um, that, are, that are 
useful, brilliant, whatever, for the first part of the book that you had no clue should have been there. And so I, for my first draft, after I've done all that stuff, I go back through one more time. I call the, the first draft my zeroth draft because it's not, it's not ready. It's not complete. Right. Never should um, be. And, then I, and then I go back and fill in those details that I know I missed. And that's my, that's my first draft. Yep. Yeah, I, I think that that's uh, terrific advice. And the, uh, the goal is to make none of this obvious when people read the book. I mean, the book should seem spontaneous. Uh, it should surprise. It should not seem as if it's methodically plotted out. <clears throat> but I think that these steps are important. And Brad, I go along with you. I think that snowflake approach is very good. And I, I, I like to approach it pretty much uh, from a marketing standpoint. Is my book going to be viable? Am I going to be able to sell it? So I come up with a title first. I want a good title. I want a title that's going to be interesting and relevant. And I come up with a tagline, uh, which is just a, a phrase, something like the, that the book is about. And then a sentence, which um, uh, gives me the plot. And then a summary, which is a paragraph. And then a chapter-by-chapter -chapter synopsis. Now, none of this is, is in stone, because as I work on the book, I'll go back and revise the synopsis. I'll go back and change the tagline. I'll go back and change the title. All this stuff evolves as it goes. And then, what I really like to do, and this has happened on the last three novels I've worked on, because I, I tend to write my novels over the summer, August comes, and I'm halfway through the book, and I drive to Gen Con. <laughs> now, while I'm driving to Gen Con, I don't have the radio on, I don't have books on tape on. I'm playing, I'm playing the book in my head, working through it, watching it as I drive. And this is my book on tape. It's book on head, right? It's book on, book on brain. And I'm playing this over and over in my mind. And by the time I get to Gen Con, I have a real good conceptual picture in my mind, a pol uh, holographic picture in my mind of what the book is going to look like. And then after Gen Con, I go home. And I finish the thing in time for world fantasy and turn it in, and that's the process that I found works. So it's basically uh, a combination of being very methodical and, uh, and, and writing things down step by step, and then playing the whole thing out in skull cinema when I have uh, six hours of just me in the highway. And then what it sounds like you're saying is that when you're actually getting to the point where you're, you've got your sentence, your concept, your title, your synopsis, and then you're starting to actually write the book. Yeah. And so I think that that was just... Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, despite what I said about meticulously planning novels, which I do, there is a lot of discovery in the process. Yeah. You know, even though I've got an 18 or 20 or 30 point outline that's like my roadmap, you know, when you're driving across the country, if you see the world's largest muskie by the side of the road, you stop <laughs> yes. and look at it. You don't say, i got to get to California. i got to get... You have to find things in the process of going, even though you have a roadmap to where you want to go, that doesn't mean you necessarily know how you're going to get there. You know, if you're driving across the country, you're going to take a super highway, you're going to take Route 6 that has, you know, all sorts of stops and attractions and stuff. Now, and one other bit of perspective to put on it, the novels that I've worked on were co-authored. And so as a result, you had to have a very clear idea of where you were going because two completely different people were coming at this story and you didn't want to just sort of bouncing all over the place. So that even sort of reinforces the value in that sort of case of having a good idea of where the story's going, what's happening. You know, we would have a detailed chapter-by-chapter -chapter synopsis uh, that you would follow, that, you know, or I would write, and then the other authors would follow. So that sort of thing helps a lot. And one reason why I like that sort of thing is I'm in software, and I'm a product designer, and I have to give a spec to people that they will then turn into software. Well. One thing I learned a long time ago is that in the process of writing that spec, you discover something that you think, or lots of some things, oh my gosh, I'm glad I never started this project without knowing that was going to come up. Right. And I noticed the same thing with working on the novels. You sit there and you start working through and go, wow, I'm glad I didn't write half the novel and then discover this. <laughs> I at least have the chance to avoid this. So it's very useful in that respect. Right, absolutely. Absolutely. Although I recently did a short story, a very short story for the front. I have a, uh, I'm a micro publisher too, and uh, I have a friend whose 500 page book I published that has 50 stories in it. We we're doing a second edition. He said, "You and I should write a story for the second edition." I was like, "What? Well, we're not going to add pages to it." <laughs> so then we're paginating. He's like, "No, no. We could write it about the cover and put it on the inside." So we had like one page, and we knew we were writing about the cover, which didn't have a story, a specific story associated with it. And he was over at my house, and we were doing some other editing on the thing. And over lunch, he started eating, and I had this idea, and I wrote down like three sentences, and I emailed it to him, even though he was right across the room. <laughs> <laughs> and 
then he wrote a few sentences and emailed it back, and we kind of snowballed this thing until it got actually too long for just one page, and then you have to edit. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter if you have the world's best outline. Eventually, you have to edit, so we edited it back to the point where it fit on, on the inside front cover, and that was really... I hadn't worked that way before. I'm not uh, living out in the middle of Wisconsin, kind of in the middle of nowhere. I'm one of these guys that goes into my room and I write. I don't talk to people. Sometimes I interact on the internet, but the internet can keep you from writing, so sometimes I don't even do that. So this was a very different experience for me, and I really, I really kind of enjoyed it. And it was kind of like we had a rough, rough piece of clay, we put it down, and I started taking pieces off, and then I'd leave it, and then he'd take pieces off, and eventually we got a whole statue, which was really kind of a neat way to work. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge uh, George Martin fan, and, and you may have um, read or heard him talk about this. He, uh, I've seen it for a number of places. He talks about in plotting, there's, there's two types of people. There's the gardeners and the architects. Mm -hmm. so, I'm an architect. So, so you're right. So the, ar the ar architect has to kind of plan out the entire house, know where everything is, how much load is on, going to be on the roof when snow hits in winter, et cetera, et cetera. So they have to plan everything out in advance. And a gardener um, knows what they're looking for roughly, uh, but they plant something and they coax it, you know, as it as it grows and it comes along. Um, one of the we we just uh, I was on a short story panel um, the previous hour and. So one of the things I would recommend to you is figure out which one you are, first of all. Um, you probably have a good idea, but then try the other method. Um, right. Break out of your shell a little bit with a short story and just see if it works for you. And um, probably won't swing you the other way, but it might let you pick up some things that you hadn't picked up before. Right, I started doing short stories the other way because my traditional method was not resulting in short stories. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. And, and when someone says, we need 5,000 words, and I sit down and I do my little outline, and I'm like, oh, I'm at 12,000 yeah, words. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of a problem. What am I going to do? And after having done that two or three times, mostly on books that Jean Ravy had, was putting together for anthologies, and fortunately, a couple of them, she was like, I'm short, so you're all right. <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay. But after doing that a couple of times, I thought, I don't want to have to edit half of a story out every time I submit it, so I'd better figure out a different way to do it. And the way to do it was to figure out, you know, just to go in with a raw concept and maybe a couple of ideas, not write a lot of stuff down, well, and then just build them. Well, and that's, you know, for short stories, uh, for me, it's a completely different way than when I was working on those books, is that it's very much, I have a very, a seed of an idea, I have a general idea of, of what's going to be the conflict and the difficulty, and I don't necessarily know exactly how it's going to end, but mm -hmm. I have a rough idea. And then I start writing. So really, I'm completely different when dealing with something short than yeah, yeah. To something longer. Yeah, so. I find the same thing. I, uh, I I came at this as a short story writer. I wrote short stories exclusively for 25 years, um, and uh, and I found that that was uh, a job where I I just wanted to discover. I would just go into the world and wander around and, and let the story evolve. But that's safe because you're just doing one arc. And, um, and you, you know when you hit the middle, and you know when you hit the end. Um, but with a novel, when I started doing novels, I just did not want to get halfway through the novel and say, oh, well, this doesn't work. Because in a story, it's no problem. You go back five pages, you go back ten pages, and you start over. I did not want to go back 150, 200 pages and start over. And um, so that was why when I began working on novels, I began plotting them out. And then, I, even though I have this, this uh, detailed synopsis, which tells me where each chapter fits, I would then write, and I will then write, each chapter, even though I have a general idea of what's going to be in it, I'll write each chapter like a short story. But making sure that I get the details in there that link up with the other chapters. And, uh, and yet, even though I'm discovering things as I write that chapter, I'm making sure I hit certain points so it lines up. One other thing, too, uh, that the, chap the, the novels that I write are multiple point of view. Each, each chapter in the novel has a different point of view. And this enables me to, to uh, frame each chapter as if it's like a short story. Um, so in uh, in Baines, for example, there are I believe uh, eight point of view characters, and we move around uh, throughout the book, uh, you know, looking at each one. And so each character has this little chapter where there's an arc, and at the end of the short story where everything would be resolved, I have a hook, and then that leads into the next chapter where whatever the other character is doing picks up uh, where that hook left us off. So I, I agree. I think a short story's got to be a different. Uh, uh, job of wandering around in the text and in the novel. You know, uh, one of the things that, that um, this 
made me think about it a bit um, is this, this is a bit about character and a bit about setting, uh, but it has to do with plot as well. Um, for for those of you that are that are writing fantasy and you know worlds that are are not Earth, um, or even even uh, stories that are set in Earth, I like to make the world a character first of all. You know, so so have it be uh, have it, the world have influence on on the plot and the characters, and, and have it have a, a tone of its own. You know, that type of thing. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I, that I like to do, and it helps me to uh, you know, break out of my, my plotting, um, uh, sometimes I think a little too linearly, so it's, it's good to break out of those. So find places in the world uh, that you can set things in that are interesting, uh, that reflect the tone of that world, uh, that you can put the characters in uh, that might uh, make it more challenging for them to accomplish their goals, um, uh, that type of thing. So it, it, it accomplishes a couple of things. Um, it, it, you're, you're not you're not stuck in you know maybe a white room syndrome where it's kind of a normal plain setting. Um, you know, think of the very interesting places in that world, and, and you know get the characters there and, and set some scenes there. Uh, I think that's a fun way to sort of shake things up a little bit um, and yeah, fill out the plot a bit. Now, you might be able to speak to this for tie-in work. One thing that I did find was I was really glad we were doing a full synopsis for this one co-authored book because we got it done and they go, oh, we have this one character from a different story. We want him to be part of the team now. Mm. <laughs> if the book was half written, trying to redo that would have been a nightmare. But because we were dealing with a very detailed synopsis, we were able to say, okay, let's start tweaking things. And I don't know if that's always true of tie-in work. It can be. I, one of the I'm going to talk about a, a bad experience, and I won't say exactly what book it was on. Um, one of the worst experiences I had is, as I say, I write detailed. I build them up the way a lot of you are talking about, but I do it on an outline stage. So when I submit an outline to someone, it's chapter by chapter, and it's telling you what's going to happen in this book. And I had it, I was working on a tie, and I had submitted an out of you know the outline that I do, which is you know each paragraph is a chapter. With all the characters and all the all the basic interactions, and you know, there were little little bits and little things missing. But basically, you could read this, and it's like a, reading a synopsis of the final book, uh, and that's the way it works. And I submitted that, and they approved it. And this is Jewish in a one of these uh, tie-in worlds, one of these shared worlds. And they looked at it and they approved it. And I wrote the whole the whole thing, which was uh, around a hundred thousand words. So it was a, a big book and sent it into the, the editor. And the editor came back to me with stuff like, this has too many characters, this is, and just a whole raft of notes, almost all of which could have been covered in the, were covered in the outline. All, you know, they were complaining about things that I had explicitly said I was going to do, characters I said I was going to reuse, and that kind of stuff. And they were like, well, it read better in the outline. And I'm, they, they're saying that, and I'm thinking, yeah, you didn't really read the outline, did you? Because <laughs> you would have known all this stuff, because there were no surprises. Big surprises. You always want the little surprises, but there were no big surprises. So that was really difficult. Um, and I'd, I'd much rather, if they had said at the outline stage, you've got too many characters, we don't like this turn, we don't like... I think I ended up, I ended up rewriting 30,000 words of that. Mm -hmm. I, I like tore out 50 and rewrote 30. Ouch. To get up to the 80 or 90, it ended up being. It was a real. It was terrible. <laughs> it was. I was. Uh, I'm still mad about it today. And it's like 10 <laughs> years later. <laughs> so, uh, so that can be tricky. It brings up an interesting point. On the, the flip side of this, uh, I haven't been in this situation, but I've talked to plenty of people that have written a uh, a treatment, you know, of their book, and they sold it on that. So maybe uh, an outline and, and three chapters, or, or maybe just the outline potentially, if you're far enough along. Uh, and the book that got accepted was nothing like the outline. Uh, they diverted from that, you know, fairly early on because they, you know, they found something better. Um, so, if you find yourself in that situation, I, I, I wouldn't be afraid to um, be true to the story. You know, try to make the story better. Um, but as an editor, I would tell you, you better talk to your editor once you find out that you're not ending up in Chicago, you're actually ending up in Los Angeles and you've killed half the cast you thought you had. You, at some point, yeah. you better call someone and tell someone and talk yeah, it over. Yeah. Because, it, you know, there's always a chance it seems like a really good idea to you, but right, you've yeah. kind of gone down the rabbit hole and, you know, you've become so interested in the minutiae that you've missed the, 
the big picture. And that's obviously especially true if you're working in a shared world or a tie-in situation. Yeah, right. So, and heaven help you if you're adapting a movie and you do that. No, heaven help you. Something that sometimes happens when we're on these panels is that we start making assumptions about what you guys know. And I know that for a long time as an author, I'm sitting here going, synopsis, outline, what, what, what are you talking about? Can you talk just a little bit about you know, what that means? Sure, I can talk to you about how I do it. Um, and again, your mileage may vary. If this doesn't work for you, I'm not telling you how to do it. This is just what I found out works for me. Okay, so title, tagline. Tagline is something very, very simple, and for veins, uh, the tagline is, some wounds never heal, all right? Now, this is a novel about surface mining. Uh, it's a novel about an ancient curse. Uh, it's a novel about uh, people who make bad mistakes. So, so th this tagline really thematically uh, tells us uh, everything about the book. Um, and, and, well, not everything, of course, but it, it gives us a sense of what it's about. Uh, for Vipers, uh, the tagline I knew going in was very much simpler, they're coming. Uh, which, you know, it, it looks good on a book cover, but it also is really what the book is about. All right, after that, what I want to do is write essentially the 100 words or 150 words that will be on the back of the book. All right? And I want to write that up. I want to make it as, as exciting and, and interesting so that when I go to that and I look at it, it is the kind of synopsis or the kind of summary that would make me want to buy that book. Then I begin the chapter-by-chapter chapter synopsis. And I actually enjoy this process. I might begin uh, going through and just writing a few sentences for each chapter, but if I find I get interested, if, I want, if I've done uh, you know, chapters 1 through 10, I've just done a couple sentences on each, I hit chapter 11 and I get really into it, I might do five or six paragraphs as the synopsis. I won't stop myself if the ideas start flowing. And I'll go through the book that way, and I'll end up with, my books tend to have a lot of chapters in them, so I might have 50 chapters, and I might have a page uh, on some of them uh, in one line on others. And, uh, and then, as I go along, I will use that as my roadmap. If I come to one of the chapters where I've written a lot, I'll actually just copy and paste that right into the manuscript and begin working on that. But basically, this is what the terms, as I use them, are. Title, of course, self-explanatory. Tagline, a little thematic phrase or sentence that, that encapsulates the whole idea of the book. Uh, summary, which is going to be on the back of the book. And your publisher will write this for you, of course, but uh, I want to create one for myself going in. And then a chapter-by-chapter -chapter synopsis, which serves as my roadmap. Now, as I write the book, I will change that chapter-by-chapter -chapter synopsis. The, the chapter-by-chapter -chapter synopsis that I end up with at the end of the book is very different from the one I had at the start. But here's one thing you want to keep in mind, and it's been mentioned earlier. Sometimes the publisher will say, send me three chapters. Okay, you've got that. And sometimes the publisher will say, send me a synopsis. I already have that. And, and, I, and it's not because it's the old synopsis that I've changed and I've gotten away from, but I have the new version of the synopsis because as I work, I change that synopsis too. So it will not only serve you as you write, but it will serve you as you market your book. That's a really clever idea because one of the things I'm really crappy at is marketing. So <laughs> maybe adopt a few of your ideas and, and come back to it. I work, uh, again, differently. You know, I tend to... Sometimes you can sell on a pitch or an idea. Sometimes you need more. Sometimes you need a whole book nowadays. It depends upon what you're doing. But usually when doing like a Dragonlance book or something, I would come up with a concept and then get a couple of paragraphs on that and then run, run it by people. Uh, not necessarily the editor, but all of you, if you're writing, at some point you have to have readers. Uh, and these should be people that know what they're talking about. They should not be your mom, unless your mom's an editor <laughs> and can give you actual feedback. You know, you want people to look at every phase of it, the, the, the plots, the characters, the spelling, everything. Because what it, once you send it to the, you know, your editor, your publisher, you can't take it back. You can't say, oh, geez, I screwed up his name in the first chapter. <laughs> so even in this, in the, and especially in really short things, and a lot of times you're trying to sell a book on a page or two pages of here's here's my concept in a paragraph usually here's here's the details for two pages and it's critically important that if you're selling a book on two pages that those two pages be precious that they shine even if as you said even if maybe you're going to deviate later so generally I would I would get the that concept and then I'd start 
short outline, you know, one, two, three, four, five, with maybe a sentence each. And then from that, I probably construct the, the longer two-page piece that I'm submitting for people to look at and say, yes, go further, or no, we're not interested in this. Yeah, one thing I wanted to pick up on that you just said, uh, when, when you say one, two, three, four, five, that's the chapter numbers. You know, when I first started this long ago, 30 years ago, uh, people would talk about outlining their books, and I thought they meant Roman numeral one, you know, and then, and then A, and then, and then one. No, you don't want to do that. that. Wouldn't that be awful to try to make a novel? Well, know? I kind of do that, but I do oh, it in a oh, course. sorry. That's a brilliant, brilliant. I wish I did that. But I do it... I do it the way you said. That's uh -huh. that's actually how I've learned to do yeah. it. You know, where if you maybe you have three major sections in books, so yeah. I do do them at Roman rules. But then, as you said, those one, two, three, those are always chapters yeah. or major plot points. Yeah, you know, and it's it's, it's beautiful the way the way, the way that happened because what works for one person uh, doesn't work for everybody, and that's why everything we say take with a grain of salt. And what I meant to say, you know, all of you knew this. Wouldn't that be terrible? I was talking about me. I mean, it, for, for me, that would be terrible, but for other people, it, it would Right, be well, for me, it gives structure, yeah. because I'm the architect and you're the gardener. Well, so. I also <laughs> wonder about, you know, pitching, because, for example, what happened uh, with one of the synopses that I had written is the game company said, look, we want a book to go in this series. Will you guys, you know, send us a synopsis? And so I sat down with the other guy who had more experience than me, so I was listening close to him. Um, what we ended up with was I'd written a 3,000-word synopsis. It read a little bit like a short story because they need to read it and be interested in it. If it's just a right. series of events, they're not going to be interested, I don't think. And I think that, you know, and oddly, it was it, sort of oddly, but until you read it, it was in the present tense, even though the story was in the past tense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, start out by saying, two down-on-their-luck adventurers are fighting their way through a mob after being caught doing this. And, you know, so you sort of, like, immediately say, here's what's happening. It's like, the way it was described to me is, you've just seen an awesome movie, and your friend goes, ooh, ooh, tell me what happened. And it's you telling them about it. Um, and so then, it, it was a really interesting process. Unlike writing short stories, or unlike writing chapters for the novel, it was a different type of thing, and it's probably even worth practicing, because it's right. fun saying, how do I turn a chapter into a really cool paragraph that reads like something that you go, ooh, I want to read the next paragraph. You know, it, it, it has to actually catch those people because if it's really dry and that might be okay for you as a working tool, but to really pitch somebody on, if that's all they're going to read and they're never going to see any more in your novel unless they buy it, it's got to sell. It's got to sell itself. And often you do use present tense for mm -hmm. pitches. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, I, I don't kind of plan it that way, but it just seems to work that way because it lends more immediacy to the story and it kind of yeah. tends to suck people in. Yeah, I think that's fairly standard Yeah. advice. So, Think yeah, about that. I think the immediacy of, of the present tense is great for short fiction, but when I read it in long fiction, I just can't take it. It's it's too much for a novel, but in but in a in a blurb, it's it's really good because it. Gets yeah, it's, the other thing is it's, it's got that you are there quality. Trying to summarize in past tense requires all these extra words you yeah. don't have room right. for in a summary. So I think that's why the present tense works. The other thing that was pointed out is that when you're writing one of these, you you. You certainly want them to be excited and surprised by what they discover, but at least to a thing we were working on, we weren't supposed to hide stuff too much. You know, it's like you might in a novel say, ooh, wait till you see. Well, this person wants to go, they're going here because they need to find out what this guy is doing, but this guy already is doing this. Maybe you draw it out a little more for the reader, but in this case, they want to go, okay, here's where the story's going, here's how the plot forms. You know. Well, and it's really hard to say to an editor. Just wait, I'm going to surprise you. Exactly <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to be surprised instead. <laughs> I want to know what I'm getting. I don't want to have to trust. You know, Mark's a great guy, and, and he's a great writer. But there comes a point, if I'm an editor and I'm putting out a big book and there's a lot of money involved, I don't want to know what I'm getting. I don't want to kind of get his manuscript and go, oh, that party he said... You're going to like this big surprise? I really hate that. <laughs> Why did he kill the entire cast and start again? <laughs> that would have been nice to know. Real quickly, one of the things I wanted to mention um, for uh, kind of for idea generation um, and for uh, helping to expand the ideas that you have, uh, don't be afraid to do an exploratory draft. Uh, don't be afraid to write with the notion that you're going to throw it away. 
Uh, a lot of things, so many things come clear after you start writing, after you start getting into the head of the characters and they start interacting with one another. So you could take maybe the ending that's clear in your head but nothing else is. You could take one of the, just the, the spur of an idea, just a bit of a scene, you just barely know the characters, and write it and tell yourself that you're not going to keep it. Um, and maybe you can start at the beginning. Where you, maybe you only have the inciting incident for the story. Uh, so, so don't be afraid to do that. I think so many things will come clear to you, uh, and the next time that you start writing for real, it will it will be much clearer. And you know, things that that can help fill in your plot too. That can lead into some of these other methods that we're talking about. You have a question? question? Mm -hmm. Kind of right into my question, which was, I you know, I, I do a lot of exploratory <laughs> drafting. Um, because I'm the discovery, you know, gardener type of writer you guys right. are talking about. Like, I'm there because I want a character to say something, and then I'm like, oh, that totally surprises me. And then, like, the stuff I find out while I'm writing. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I have my, my novel, I give it to my beta readers, and they read it, and they're like, you know, this whole section isn't working for me, and then all these other little things aren't working for me. And then I go back, and I look at the export and I'm like, <sighs> okay, now what? <laughs> so I'm, like, trying to become a better plotter so that, you know, the going back isn't as painful and agonizing. But I don't know if that's going to suck all the joy out of life, <laughs> or what you know. Like I don't know if you guys have anything to say about when you go back and are revising with the plot or not topic that we're talking about. It's a combination of joy and extreme pain. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't. No one said this here, but first drafts are junk. It doesn't matter how good you are. Your first draft is junk. No one ever sees my first draft except me. Often, no one sees my second draft but me, and sometimes third or fourth draft. You know, so by the time I get there, hopefully I've worked out a lot of those kinks. Because I'm an architect, generally I don't run into the kind of specific problem that you're running into. Uh, and it might help if there are problem areas rather than just trying to wing them. You might help, even though you're a gardener, it might help to know that you want roses here, and so you're going to plan that rose trestle over in this area, because you're having difficult with, difficulty with that. Um, Were you going to say something? I, I, I love your metaphor of the rose trestle. Uh, let's say that you are planting that garden, and you, you put a rose trestle over there, and you put a, a little dwarf pine over there, and, and then you get the whole garden done, and, and that, that dwarf pine and rose trestle, they're just not working. You've got to rip them out. Uh, and it hurts, because you, you spend okay, a lot of time yes. putting those babies in, but uh, they've got to come out. And, um, and I would encourage you, if you hit that point where you say, oh my gosh, I, I can't get this to finish. Um, when you get to that point, that's probably where you're getting to your novel. You're getting to the soul of your novel at that point. When you reach the point where you say, I thought this was going to be good, but I don't know how I'm going to finish it. That's where I think you are not writing the books you've read, but you're now writing your own book. Maybe up to that point, you've kind of been following the things you've seen done, but now you're in your own territory. And so when you get to the point where you say, you know, I worked so hard on chapters 15 and, 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 and 30, but they've got to come out, and that's going to mean everything shifts, and I've got to rewrite the whole thing, that's a gift. Because that's when you are beginning to write your book. So rip those babies out and invest another couple months in it, because that's when it really becomes something you're going to sell and put your name on and be known for. Even though it is painful. Yeah, it's always painful. You, you know, I, I don't remember who said this, but almost every writer that I know knows the phrase, and that's kill your darlings. Yeah. There's going to come a time when you're writing, whether it's a short story or a novel, where there's something that you just loved and loved and loved. And maybe you've hung on to it through <laughs> four drafts, and you get to that fifth draft, and you're like, that was really clever four drafts ago, and I love it. And it's completely derailing what I'm doing on this page right now, and it has to go. Or unkill your darlings. My friend Beth killed a baby and her editor wouldn't let her. She had to bring it back. A <laughs> <laughs> um, question way in the back. Yeah, uh, how exactly do you think this, uh, you know, the structuring of plot uh, or with, uh, work with things like uh, you know, political scheming, Machiavellianism, you know, just like uh, where you have to keep track of like so many different people's motivations. Um, how do you guys usually deal with something like that if you ever have? Yeah, I, I like to get to know the characters. Because even though I have the plot all mapped out, the characters are going to surprise me. And I'm going to go with, that, with those surprises. Uh, when they do something I haven't mapped out for them, I'm going to let them do that. 
And sometimes that results in me having to tear out the rose bush because what they've done is far more interesting than what I thought they were going to do. So uh, once you create the plot and once you put your characters in motion, get to know them and as you write, try to follow them as you lead them. You know, you'll start off trying to lead them and make them do the things you want them to do, but eventually they'll start doing other things. So I don't know if this is a satisfactory answer, but uh, I think it comes across in the drafting. If you're going to spend six months on a novel, you're going to really get to know those characters. And so this isn't something, unlike plot, I don't think you can create kind of a resume for each one of your characters and say this is what they do where it's almost like a role-playing game um, you know, set, of, set of guidelines for the character. I find in writing novels I can't do that. I've got to just put the, to put the character into the plot, have a sense of where I think she's going to go, and then start her off and then follow her. And although that might seem kind of metaphysical and, uh, and kind of fuzzy, it really begins to become easy and recognizable when I get into that uh, fifth or sixth month. I really know these characters. And so if I'm going to spend, um, uh, say, ultimately a year on a book um, in the second half of the year being on polishing and finishing, um, that's when I really know the characters. And even though there might be a dozen characters and they're, they're, they're all scheming and they're very complex, I know them like I know my friends, who are also scheming. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to see something? Important? Yeah, yeah. I, I would actually recommend for that kind of story, trying to plot backwards. Uh, I think that re works really well for that type of story where you're trying to, uh, you're focusing on like the, the, the twists and the surprises as you, as you go through the story. And if you, if you know what you're looking for, you should know what you're looking for at the end, you know, the, the, the big reveal. And if you, if you start with that and work backwards through the plot towards the beginning, um, I, you can construct it in such a way. I think I think it lends itself to um, creating those twists um, along the way. It's a it's something we've talked about here for like a full hour, so we can't uh, go into a ton of detail. But um, but I think that could help. Being the architect, I'm going to recommend a story bible where you have paragraphs about your characters because you want to know what uh, the important thing is. What each character wants. And as he said, it may be at the beginning you think they want one thing, but then they want another. And that's really cool, and I love finding that out. But since I have written stories that have a lot of characters in them, I keep a paragraph or two on each character. This is this character, this is what they want, this is where they're going. You know, and maybe there's some, some kind of cool thing that I can write there that's going to remind me how they speak or something like that. Because it, it can, if you're doing a long piece of work. Or you know, or a series, it can get hairy. Saying, "Okay, what was his motivation? What was he doing? I know he was going to be in this scene, but where is he coming from?" Um, and again, because I'm in the architect, I work very differently at that than you do. I keep track, and I say, "Okay, if this changed during the story, I'm going to note the change here, and then in, when I redraft, I'm going to make sure what's happening there is consistent." Because if I found something out about the character on you know on word five, uh, fifty thousand. It may affect something that happened in Word 10,000, you know, back on Word 10,000. Then you want to be able to go back and get it and make sure that it all fits with what's coming later that you really liked. So the woman in the white hat, you had a question? Yeah, um, I started with the story bible and then um, I have very detailed characters and I have a very detailed uh, plot and that is nailing me down and I can't figure out how... It's, it's, it feels like I'm in prison, and I can't figure out how to get out of prison. Yeah. Henry James had advice for that, um, and he said, um, look at the details. Put your character on a street. You know, wherever your character is in the, in, in, the, in the novel, put that character in that room, and then describe the details. Describe the actions. You have a general sense of what the chapter is going to do and what the novel needs to do, but let's start writing the minutiae. And so if you concentrate on the room that the character is in, the things the character is doing in that room, the details of that room, you know, let us see the sunlight coming through the window, let's see the cat by the fireplace, uh, let's see the mysterious shadow in the corner that the character is, is not, is purposely ignoring uh, because, uh, you know, because she's mad at this person who is watching her from the corner. If you really start to focus on those things, then you'll get interested. The idea is to get away from that plot summary and those, those character details that you've drafted out, and those are now in your mind, and then play with them, work with them. 
But I think, uh, and this gets back to the advice that I think Hemingway gave, which was, yeah, it was Hemingway, write one true word and then follow it with another true word. And what he meant was put the details in order. Of course, there have been times when I've been writing and I write the. <laughs> I can't get the next true word, but, but you're going to have to accept that sometimes happens. And if you have a very detailed setting um, and you're really feeling bound by your plot, you might just want to throw the plot out, take your character, put them in the setting, and then just mm -hmm. see, what they, see what they do, see what they say. A lot of times, I come from um, a comic book background uh, and a visual arts background, so a lot of times for me, the story really starts to come alive when the characters start talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And then I discover things about them that I never knew about them before. And that's always really exciting. And often that's not in any plot or outline that I've done. You know, and, and famously, I think, J.R.R. Tolkien, what did he write? The, the Fellowship of the Ring twice and completely didn't, wrote it and put that aside. Didn't look at it again, then wrote it again. And I think he did the same thing with The Hobbit, like two or three times. And maybe sometimes you have to write some of it. And that say, might be a decent plan for you if you've got this thing. Set it aside and start writing from memory and mm -hmm. get some writing. Yeah, don't look at the outline. That could really help. Yeah, and maybe in the future, maybe you are more of a gardener than you realize. You know, what right? I mean? <laughs> so maybe don't put as much detail on a, the next project that you work on. And maybe yeah, work. I, I normally write specs also, and it's like. I, I did it the same way, and it's not working. <laughs> right. Yep. Try so, something else. Next, uh, you had a question? Um, yeah, that was actually kind of a good lead-in. Uh, I am I'm fairly good at doing immersion and details and environment. What I am not so good at is coming up with plot, of all things. I, I can get you there. I can make you feel like you're there. You're talking with the characters. But I can't come up with things for them to do. So it's, it's hard for me to get a story started. All of this is great advice for me. I just I need to find a way to get a plot. Well, what are you interested in? What's what's sucking you into this world? What makes you want to write? Because a lot of times, well, it could be just characters. You know, I have this character in mind, and I like this character. And sometimes you can have a character you know and a world you know, and again, just set him loose. Say, okay, he's standing, he's sitting behind a table at Gen Con, and. He's, uh, he's claustrophobic, and there are a lot of people in the room, and, and how is he going to react, and then go from there. And that can become a whole plot by figuring out what the character, if you know the characters, what do they want? What are they interested in? Are they in sex? Are they interested in money? Are they interested in power? If they want to be president of the United States? Sometimes those kind of things, if you can figure out what your characters want, that will kind of dictate what they do and how they interact with a setting you know. Is this how you guys all come up with points? Um, what, um, what, what I'm hearing is that um, you, can, you, you're, you have the setting, you have the characters, but there's, there's no forward momentum uh, or no focus forward momentum uh, in what you're writing. Um, and what you could do is think of a three-act structure. And so you've got the this, this setup. Where is the character at the beginning? Um, where is the character when the story opens? And the most important question is, what does the character want at that point in her life or his life? All right. And then, once you know what the character wants, you know your second act is going to be, what keeps your character from it? And now the second act is going to be most of your book. I'm using the term, the words act very loosely here. And so you've got a series of things that keep that character from what he or she wants. And then the third act is, is getting what he or she wants. And often it's interesting if in that third act the character ends up getting something different or arriving at some place unexpected only to realize that the, the thing she really thought she wanted wasn't what she wanted at all and this is re really where she wants to be. Um, so it's a matter of determining what the character wants and then keeping, devising interesting ways of keeping the character from that until finally the character arrives at some place. So if you think about that three-act structure, and then if you just go ahead and do what you do, which is the, the, what, what makes us write stories, this is why we write stories, because we like being in these worlds that our characters are existing in. And each one of these characters is a manifestation of us, so we get to explore the, the, these worlds we create through aspects of ourselves. This is fun. 
Plotting's not particularly fun, uh, but, but writing uh, the characters in motion is. So maybe for you, uh, it might be just if you think of the, the, the three-part structure of your book and keep your character from her goal as long as possible and make it interesting. Well, you were going to say that? Let's let Brad say something. Yeah. One second, Sorry. we'll come right back to it. Uh, I, I just wanted to well, elaborate maybe a little bit. You'll, you'll hear all these chestnuts in writing. Um, character is plot is one of them, and that kind of speaks to what Larry said. But I want to talk about another one very quickly. The... Um, read a little bit into um, internal and external arcs. Uh, the internal arc is what the character wants, and it's the emotional journey that they go through in trying to get what it is they want most right, throughout the, the book. They may or may not achieve that in the end. Um, you, may, you may deny that to them um, by, the, by the time the story finishes. And then the external arc plays against the internal arc. Uh, the external arc is the, the external, external things that are happening to them, the things that they're trying to do physically, the people that are in their way, the world that's in their way, um, social, political things that stop them from achieving what they, what they want, what they want most. And so um, as they're trying to achieve their internal goals, the external influences are preventing them from doing it. And it's, and it's kind of the, um, the progression of those two things uh, that lead towards the end. And, both should resolve. The external arc should resolve in some way, and so should the internal arc, um, you know, through their emotional fulfillment or denial of, of what they're looking for. So, And one thing I was going to suggest is, you know, maybe you even want to dial things back a lot. I mean, we're talking about books and novels and massive story arcs. Maybe you want to just do some do some writing and not worry about where it's going to go or who's going to get it and say, all right, I've got a cool character. It's something as simple as my the guy needs to get to the office in time for a job interview. So you've got a guy, he's heading to an office for a job interview, and now you think, like they were saying, what's stopping him? What's the first thing that gets in his way? And just tell that story to yourself. Type it out. Type, his keys are lost. It's a simple, simple thing. But what may happen is as you start writing, you'll realize that these answers start appearing as you write. You're like going, his keys are lost. Oh, where are they? Um, he last saw them in the kids' room. And you're like, he has kids. And they hide his keys. That's a problem. And your story will start to evolve. You'll start to see this. It doesn't have to go anywhere. You don't have to send it to anyone. Just write it for yourself. And as you do that, you'll start to see these, these plots and story arcs start to emerge. And it may help to inspire you to then see a bigger story arc, a bigger plot for this character. And then maybe you'll end up where you want to be there. And you can start working through some of the bigger issues. You don't generally sit down and go, I want to write a book about this? Oh, well, no. I, you can. I mean, you could. I mean, if for, for me, the things that I do is I think, oh, you know what would be really cool is a story about a guy who could, like, what if in a steampunk world, I wrote a short story, for example, and I started turning into a book. You know, what if it's a steampunk world and the way that the steampunk stuff works is by people who can, like, bring the life by whispering to them. You know, instead of a, a horse whisperer, what if it's a machine whisperer and we whisper to them, talk. The thing starts talking or walk, and the thing starts walking. So then I'm like, ooh, that's cool. I'm like going, ooh, but what if these people were in this world, and what would happen to this poor guy? And that's sort of how it started to germinate, or a, a big plot. So there's lots of different ways ideas come to me. But I'm just suggesting that whole idea of that very simple approach as a neat way to sort of get into writing and thinking about plots and stories. And find the thing that interests you in the, the thing. You asked how we come up with our ideas. A lot of times, because I'm art trained, I'll have a visual that appears in my head, you know, uh, while I'm doing something else entirely. And usually you want to always have some paper close at hand so you can write stuff down, because if you're anything like me, you lose those thoughts. If you don't, <laughs> if you don't write them down, they go away, and sometimes you lose some good ones. Um, but often I'll see just a visual that's, you know, I'm watching uh, monster movies on Turner Classic Movies, and I'll suddenly, in my head, see a, a, a film noir kind of cover of a guy firing an automatic pistol and an ant, in the giant ant in the middle, middle of the desert. And then you go, okay, well, how did, how did that happen? Who is that guy? Why are there giant ants there? And what's happening there? And, and I, way, I wrote that story. That's the same thing I just said. You know, it's the guy needs to get to a job interview, but his keys are lost. Oh, why are his keys lost? Just like you said, why is the giant ant in the desert? It's just doing it a little more mechanical. Why is the guy in the desert? Oh, one, <laughs> one more thing to, to throw on this um, fire um, is, <laughs> I, I, to answer your question directly, I don't do that. I don't think I'm going to write a story about this. Um, what, what, what I have is kind of a, a feel for the milieu, I, and I research a little bit into that style of, of world and time period. Uh, but I really work hard on like the, the world, the magic system, the political system, the, the cultures that are in play, 
And things start coming naturally from that, like the, the conflicts between cultures. And, and then I pick people that are representative of those cultures, and then I put them in play against each other. And, and the story starts to evolve naturally from there. So for me, it's about um, getting the world, getting the characters that have uh, built-in tension already, and then the, and the story kind of flows for me anyway, that way. He's been waiting for a while to ask yeah. a question. Oh, um, I'm not great at uh, uh, A couple of minutes. Uh, Larry said a couple of times, both of this in the last panel, like, that one of the things he starts with is a title. Um, um, besides from writing, you know, another thing I really suck at is making titles. <laughs> <laughs> I spent five hours on the phone with an editor once working on a title. Yes. Five <laughs> hours. <laughs> is that something you guys pay attention to at all when you're starting, or, or vary, or, or the chapter titles, or, 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 um, or to, to help you outline, or... Or do you even care, do you care about them at all? I mean, what's, I know you do. <laughs> the title will, get you, will, will sell the work, will, will help sell the work. That, that's the first thing the editor sees. Uh, of course, with the vein cycle, it's easy. I mean, they all begin with V, uh, you know, so veins, vipers, vortex. Um, but, but those words are very important, too, what's in the book. But I, I, I know that the, the panelists uh, will, will have things to say about this. But I just wanted to say that the, the time you spend creating your title and, uh, and, and even if they're not one word titles, the time you spend will help sell that story. That's the first thing the editor sees if you're an unknown writer. Um, and it's what's going to make that editor read the first sentence. And I recently realized that there were times where my titles were very clever and were actually working against selling the work. You know, and you, have, you, have to, you do have to spend a lot of time. Yeah. And it, I think it's interesting you do that first because sometimes, usually I'll have a title. But then I'll, often I'll change it, and, and sometimes I'll, I'll change it and change it again. You know, there's Absolutely. a story I'm working on now that's on its like third or fourth title. And it's all a matter of trying to tell people what it's about and get, get them interested in it. Yeah, I, I like having that stuff early. I don't have to have it right away, but like character names, I, I've got to have those down. Because I, mm. they, just, they just aren't real to me unless I have that. But like the title I like to have fairly early, I'll definitely have a working title if nothing else. But then I'll, I'll work on it later if I, don't, if I don't like it, if it's not gelling. I like having that stuff. When I did the, um, the Dragonlance Catriona series um, that I did, it was Warrior's Heart, Warrior's Blood, and Warrior's Bones. And I had those, idea, those titles and those ideas very early on. And while, while I was writing, it helped me focus. It was like each title told something about what was going to be in the story. And having had that and the outline for the series, a lot of me saying, okay, remember this is Bones. This is what we're talking about, you know, the things that hold things up. We're oh. talking about heart, the things that motivate you. And I suck at titles. I hate writing titles. I save it for the end, praying to heaven that something comes to me. <laughs> I was telling Five my hours, man. I wish I had hours. numbered my stories on the way through. I'm like, this is story four. <laughs> but apparently that's not acceptable. So, uh, but unless you're, unless you're a one to Janet Ivanovich, in which case you can get away. But anyway. Um, Anyway, we are out of time. Uh, thanks, everyone, for... Uh, we don't have time for last words, I'm afraid, but thanks, everybody, for coming, and uh, we hope that... Thanks, audience. It was great. 7A. I am number four. Zero one, two, yeah.